to you. Praise God. I know on the way coming in, you must have been handed one of these palm crosses. Let me see if you've got one. If you haven't got one, some of the stewards will just go around. That's great. For those who haven't got one, can I see your hand? Great. There are quite a few people here. So, stewards, just give them one as well because this is part of my message today, all right? So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. And uh, I just want to start uh, by prayer, if that's okay. And uh, let's just pray that the word of the Lord will speak to each and every one of us. Amen. Hallelujah. If you want to close your eyes and just ask the Spirit of God to, to do what He wants to do. Hallelujah. Father, we just come to you now and we humble ourselves. And Lord God, we just open our hearts to you. We open our souls to you. We open our minds to you. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, speak. Speak to each and every one of us, O Lord God. Speak us what you want us to hear, O Lord God. Speak to us, O Lord God, the Rema word, O Lord Jesus, that is from you, O Lord Jesus. Father, we don't want to hear the voice of any man, but we want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, soften our hearts and let the word of God bear much fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So, turn to somebody next to you and tell them. That's, that's, I do that when Pastor Mike's coming home to preach. Pastor Jody should have done to me. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them, it's Palm Sunday today. <laughs> One of my friends called me up, he said, have you lost your mind? I said, no, I haven't lost my mind. Come to church tomorrow, listen to my message. The title of my message today is Palm Sundays. Okay? And... Um, it's a message that the Lord spoke to me and, and I just want to bring it all to us. There's a story of a tree called Methuselah in Israel. In 1963, uh, a group of uh, excavators were excavating a site in uh, a place called Masada Fortress in Israel. Now that is where Herod's palace was. Uh, from the times of Jesus. So during the excavation, they found uh, a, a bag of seeds and these were date seeds from the times of Jesus. No, they stored them, they exported them to uh, a particular lab in uh, Switzerland. They stayed there for 40 years till somebody, one of the scientists from Israel asked for some of the seeds because she works with the seeds, she's an agricultural scientist and she said, let me see if I can try to bring them back to life. And now it was already quite remarkable that these seeds had been preserved for over 2,000 years. So she takes five of these seeds, uh, she fertilizes them and, and does a few things to them and then plants three of them. One of the seeds started to shoot up. And became a small sapling. And from there they planted into a pot. And from there they planted into uh, a place. Which is actually now a quarantine place. And not anybody can just go there. And as of today. It is a full fledged grown up tree. About 18 years of age. A date palm tree. From the times of Jesus. Now you can read that story on the internet. On, on Jewish Post, there's a website called Jewish Post, there's, uh, you know, Israel sites as well, and they're quite, quite proud of this. It's a story of resurrection, and it's a date palm, and it's a male date palm, and I'll explain that in a moment as well as we go along. Now, I was quite uh, sort of uh, intrigued by that story, so I said, you know what, let me just share that. Let me just share that, because, you know, some, some Christians are even commenting and saying that this is a prophetic sign of the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. A tree that has been resurrected from the times of Jesus and planted and is a full fetch. So Google, find out Methuselah date palm tree. Like I said already, the title of my message is Palm Sundays. And there's one 
particular or three particular verses from one particular chapter that we're going to be highlighting today. It's a three point message and those three points are found in those three verses. So turn with me to the slide and that is Psalm 92 verses 11, uh, sorry 12 to uh, 14. But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the course of our goal. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. Everybody say palm tree. Palm tree. Palm tree. Palm tree. Palm tree. Palm tree. Now, there are three points that I want to talk about. Righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Transplanted in the house of the Lord. Second point and number three is on the slide. That they will still bear fruit in old age. Now, I want to show you a picture of a dead palm tree, what they look like. Now, I'm sure you've seen it all, but I'm, I'm building something here, so stay with me on this journey. This is a picture, quite tall, quite handsome, like me. No. You might have noticed I'm wearing a little bit of a, a leafy shirt today. My wife suggested that idea that uh, I should do, do that today. So, one of the verses that we find in coming to our first point here is this, that the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Why the palm tree? Why, what does it signify? Or of all the trees, why would God use the palm tree? It's always intriguing and interesting to see when God symbolizes us to something else that is not human. Right? Something else that is a tree. Of course, there are many other symbolisms in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but one of this particular symbolism of us being a palm tree planted in the house of the Lord is quite an interesting and intriguing and in fact, a very, very important principle. But why the palm tree? So in order to understand why the palm tree, we need to look at the palm tree a little bit closer. Is that okay? Right? Who here knows the palm trees very well? Who's grown here dead palm trees? Anybody here? Dead palm trees, owners, farmers? No? That's great. That's great. I'm speaking to the right audience. All right? So we are all here to learn, like Brother Asha says during leadership classes. Exodus 15, verses 27. One reference that is given to us is this, that after leaving Mara, the Israelites traveled on the oasis of Elim, where they followed 12 springs and 70 palm trees. They found 12 springs and what else? 70 palm trees. Why not the mango trees? I like mango. I might like them. Why not the apple trees? Or the pear trees? Why the palm trees? And why number 70? And why the 12 springs? Now all these things are great and we can go into the details of all of that but I'm not going to concentrate on that but I just want to say one thing that 12 as we all know is a very biblical number. 12 tribes, 12 disciples. 70 times 7 is a number of unlimited grace as Jesus said to Peter you must forgive your brother the 70 times 7 but like unlimited. You know, so it's a number of grace. Again, we see a hidden reference in the Old Testament about palm trees. In fact, the Old Testament, in fact, the, and the New Testament refers to palm trees over 50 times. Over 50 times. Now, I could have all the references for you, but I'll just show you a couple of more references to establish my point here. In 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 29, it says, He decorated all the walls of the inner sanctuary and the main room with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Brother, why the palm trees? Why not something much more nice? I like, you know, Japanese bonsais. I don't know if you have Japanese bonsai. I bought one yesterday while I was looking for something for today. And, and I showed it to one of my friends and he admired it. He said, it's nice. Uh, Japanese bonsai, quite nice little trees, cute, you know, take years for them to grow. That's more, okay? Japanese bonsai, there are many other majestic trees out there. Why the palm trees? Carvings of the palm trees. When God is going into a detail about something, listen, 
there is a lesson for us to learn. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Right? So there is a lesson for us to learn. So many references in the Old Testament. The 70 palm trees, all the carvings in the temples go to be the palm trees. Ezekiel sees the, the, the temple in his vision in Ezekiel chapter 40 and chapter 41. And what he sees there, the carvings of the palm trees on the walls. No other trees are mentioned, but palm trees. In the inner rooms of the temple, the carvings of the palm trees are mentioned. That is, for me, quite an interesting thing. Now, few interesting things about palm trees is this, that they can reach up to 70 feet tall. That is almost 11 times of my height. 11 of me stacked together, that's taller than this, this city. Okay, the they seeds that are produced through the dates are, this is interesting, 50% male and female. So palm trees are one of those trees that are both, not one tree, but some of them are male and some of them are female. Not every palm tree that is a male will produce dates, but it will produce the flower that produces the pollen that then germinates and interacts in the agricultural terms with the female palm trees and produces fruit. No wonder why God compares the righteous planted in the house of the Lord to what? A palm tree. Because it comes into sexes, male and female. There is no other, you know what I mean. There are no other radiuses or no other, uh, what's the word, you know. No more genders on this. There are only two. Even with the palm trees, okay? Um, they start bearing fruit. They, this is, look at this. This, this, is, uh, this caught my attention. They start bearing fruit at five to eight years. An increase in production as they mature. Reaching peak production between 30 to 35 years. The married people, it makes sense. Children, it makes sense to you later. And declining by age of 60. So by the age of 60, the production of the fruit declines in the palm trees. They don't stop, but it slows down. The process slows down. Now this is a fun fact. They reach the end of their reproductive life by age 80. So in other words, by the age of 80, they can't produce any more fruit. Okay? So some of you, you've got a long way to go. I, I don't know if you notice there, but this is as close as it gets to a human life cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm speaking to somebody here. Right? This analogy and symbolism of us being compared to palm tree, that is why. There are reasons again why God compares us to palm trees. It's a giving tree. Every part of the palm tree is usable. The trunk for the timber. The leaves, the shoots that come out before the leaves, they are used to make crates and furnitures. The leaves are used to even, this palm process that we are handing out today, are actually form the palm trees in India somewhere, as I looked up the description from where I ordered. They are a giving tree. Giving tree more than they take. The proportion of what the palm trees actually require to produce fruit is actually quite out of proportion in terms of what they give in return. So they are a giving tree. No wonder why God compares us to palm trees. They thrive under limited circumstances, limited resources. Now you might know that the soil that is required or, or the soil that they can even produce fruit is, is a bit of a sandy soil. That's why you find them in deserts. Not exactly just in sand, but a soil that is mixed with sort of desert sand. It's a sandy soil. And even in that sandy soil, they are able to produce fruit. Isn't that remarkable? Thriving under limited resources. What does that say about them? Is that this is a supernatural phenomenon. I don't need to rely on my own efforts and naturally what I can produce. All I need to know that if God is on my side, everything will be alright. Amen. That is another reason as to why we are compared to a palm tree. They are firm and stable under tough circumstances. 
You know, in America, you get a lot of hurricanes. Most of the time, most of the trees are blown away by those hurricanes. But the tree that still stands, and you can see a lot of the pictures of it, videos of it on the internet, is the palm tree. The palm tree still stands. Even though it's quite tall and it's getting the most wind, but it is bending under the wind, it is flexible, it is malleable, the, the wood is not that solid wood, actually the timber in the palm is a soft wood, it's not a solid wood, it's not hard wood, so it bends and gives in to the circumstances and maneuvers it way with the winds and the hurricanes that it faces and yet it remains stable and cannot be moved and untouched under those stormy circumstances. No wonder why God compares us to palm trees. It's an evergreen tree. Get a palm tree and it's going to grow. And once it grows, it's going to stay green all year round. All year round it's green. The leaves are green. I know there are many other palm trees, but palm tree has that one characteristic about it that once it's solidly established, it's going to stay green. All year round, no matter whatever the circumstances. Now, if you know about desert climate, it has two extremes. Yeah? Extremely cold. Or extremely hot. And what trees that you find there? Palm trees. So no matter if the life is going extremely cold or extremely hot, if we are to be like palm trees, we are still going to thrive. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. Another reason is because of its root system. The root system of palm tree is different from most of the tree's root system. It's called fibrous root system. Now what is a fibrous root system? Let me show you a picture of a fibrous root system there. That's fibrous root system. Looks quite rough, isn't it? But what you might not know is that most of the trees and the plants, they have a long and a deep growth. Okay? The roots are deep. So when I was studying about this, I said, this isn't going along with my message. The roots are not deep. They are shallow. They are not actually quite deep roots. What, what's the lesson here? And then again, it caught my attention is that it's not about how long the roots are. It's about how it is planted and we'll come on to that in a moment. The roots, the interesting thing about the roots is they, 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 they spread sideways. They have horizontal growth, the root system of the palm trees is called. There are many other trees that have that, but particularly with these date palms, they have that fibrous root system where they are spreading horizontally. They are taking ground, they are, they are taking territory, they're not going too deep, they don't need to go too deep. And of course, root systems have three different functions. One, that they serve as an anchorage for the palm tree. Now you might think to yourself, again, it brings to my point, which is quite interesting, is that if these trees are unshakable and unmovable, shouldn't their roots be quite deep? Mr. Builder, you've got something to say there? Whenever you are building something and we talk about foundations we say foundations gonna be deep and strong right yes. right but it's the opposite with the palm trees they are one of the tallest with one of the shortest foundations how come and then god compares us to the palm trees we'll come on to that you'll get your answer i promise you you'll get your answer in a that. but it's an interesting thing the root system is very short in comparison to what it offers so these are some of the reasons, some of the facts as to why God compares and tells us that righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody next to you and say, today you are a palm tree. Hallelujah. <laughs> some of you don't want to be plants. That's okay. I know you, you like to eat meat, that's fine. For the sake of all the vegans, come on, palm trees. Palm trees today, amen? amen. Number two, this is my second point. Transplanted in the house of the Lord. 
Why the word transplanted? What does it entail? Now, I don't know if you ever noticed this before. Most of the Bible translations, NKJV, KJV, AMP, and NIV, they all use the word planted. But when I was looking into this, and I, was, I like to look at it, the Hebrew side of things at times, just to get a deeper understanding and a meaning. And this blew me. And then it also helped me to understand that the translation that I used is actually one of the best right now, which is NLT, New Living Translation. It uses the word, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree transplanted in the house of the Lord. Amen? Come on, turn to somebody next to you and say, transplanted is the word. Not planted. Transplanted in the house of the Lord. Now there's a big difference, massive difference, be planted and transplanted. Now what is the difference? Now planting means actually to plant something from scratch. Like when God said, you know, when he said uh, he planted a garden in the east, the word used there is planted. When Jeremiah was speaking, you know, he said, I'm commissioning you. And he said to Jeremiah, go and uproot and plant. The word there used is planted. The Hebrew words is nata, N-A-T-A, -A, which means to plant, planted. And that's the word that is used over 58 times in the Bible. But the word that is used here is only used 10 times in the Bible and is called Sata. Everybody say Sata. Sata. It means to transplant. Now what it means to transplant is that you might be in the wrong place. So you need to take yourself out of that place and plant yourself somewhere else. That's what transplantation means. Okay, you take it over here and you put it somewhere else. That's transplantation right in front of you. Do you understand? Yeah. But now if I sow some seeds into this pot and let them grow, that's planting. So God is using a particular word for a reason. Because he understands that the trees are not in the right place. The trees are not growing. The trees are not bearing fruit. So they need to be transplanted where? In the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So in order to bear fruit, the key to that fruitfulness is that they need to be transplanted. So I don't know where your priorities are planted today. They need to be transplanted in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that is why the Bible is, is, astonishes me when I just look into some words and it's like, God, you know what words to use and where to use. For years and years, I thought the word was planted. Transplant. Transplant. If things, priorities are in the wrong places, transplant today. Amen? Transplant them into the house of the Lord. Now, in my opinion, and this is my research, this is my experience, this is my scriptural understanding, this is my understanding for nearly being in the church for 20 years in Holy Nation Church. Before that, I had no church. This is the only church. Okay? So, these are the three levels of transplantation I want to talk to you about. Okay? Three levels of transplantation that I have seen happen. And I have seen some stay at level one, some go to level two, and some reach level three. Or call it the three stages. Or call it the three elements of transplantation. One, your church attendance matters. Amen? I understand. If you don't want to... No, no, it's okay. I understand. I understand why you don't want to say amen because you are learned, you know. If you say amen, that means you are agreeing with me. I know, I know, it's hard. So I'll say it again. Your church attendance matters. Half, half, 40%. Psalm 84, verse 10. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life. How many of you are living the good life? How many of us enjoy living the good life? I like the Message Bible. I refer it to sometimes. You know, it's, 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 it's not 
a translation as such, but it is a modern day translation and really hammers some of the point in modern day language. So if we can put that verse up in the Message Bible, you skip the one in, in the uh, NLT as well. But let's go to, I think it's two slides later. And it says there, one day spent in your house, this beautiful place of worship, beats thousand spent on Greek island beaches. I would rather scrub floors in the house of my God than to be honored as a guest in the place of sin. This is King David talking. He says that I would rather scrub the floors in the house of my God than to be on Greek islands. Nothing against Greek islands. I've not been there. I'm sure they are nice. Nanzaroti, I don't know. This is a Greek national no, Greek. Sorry. Cyprus, Greek island, right? I'm sure I've been there to Cyprus. But the message says that uh, I would rather be scrubbing floors in the house of the Lord than to be on Greek islands. So often we miss the house of the Lord because we want to be on a Greek island. I know, I'm just using the terminology Greek island. I'm sorry if you're planning holidays to Greek island. Okay? Change them. Go to Bulgaria. It's a nice place. In other words, I'd rather be in the house of the Lord than to spend my time socializing and miss the house of the Lord for the sake of something else. We've got seven days in a week. Six of them can be compromised, but one day should never be compromised. Amen? One day should never be compromised. I was talking to Pastor Mike. I said, Pastor Mike, how many registered members do we have in the church? And, uh, you know, we talk statistics sometimes, and he's, he's excellent in statistics. Sometimes they go against him, but anyway. Um, he said about 235, okay? And I said, okay, what's our attendance, average attendance? He said, around 180 on, on a given Sunday. I said, well, that works out to be 80%. And that's what I said to him at that time. I said, that's pretty good. So, yeah. When I was typing this message, I said to myself, that's not good. Are you with me? Yes. I said to myself, why the 20% are missing? I said to myself, why should I be happy with the 80% whilst it should be 100%? Are you with me? Why shouldn't it be 99% given the 1% for any emergency or whatever it may be? Why is it not 100%? Why is it 80%? Why isn't everybody coming every Sunday? Why is it that the Sundays get negotiated over many other things that has no eternal value whatsoever? And today we heard it in the pastoral and I didn't talk to Sister Linda and she brought something, a rhema word from the Spirit of God that the man who found the treasure sold everything, fought for, bought the field and moved to that field. Some of us, we need to transplant our priorities, our mindset, our focus back into the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because our Sunday attendance matters. The Lord shall provide all your needs. Amen. You can sacrifice your work. You can sacrifice your duties. You can sacrifice whatever it gives you on Sundays to be in the house of the Lord. Because that is the one thing that the Lord says brings fruitfulness. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Missing the Sundays. Not being there on Sundays. Not being there in the house of the Lord. No. No. It doesn't say that. We all want to be like the palm tree. We want to have the characteristics like the palm tree. We want to be unwavering under tough circumstances. We want to do all the good things. But we don't understand the process behind it. You see, the problem is so many Christians have become event-oriented, breakthrough, hungry Christians. Let's get to the meeting. Someone's going to pray for me. And this is a boom. I've got the spirit now. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. If it worked like that, Jesus would not have spent three and a half years with his disciples. If it, does, it, does, if it works like that, God would not have said in his word that the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree transplanted in the house of the Lord. 
It doesn't work like that. We want the effects, but we are not interested in the cause. We want the fruitfulness, but we don't know what the planting entails. We understand that we need results, but we are not interested in the process that brings about those results. Are you with me, sir? Yeah. People at the back. See, coming to church is so vital that everything starts and spurs from there. Being in the house of the Lord is so vital that if we start compromising that, the next thing that we will compromise is our input into the ministries. Okay? Then once that's compromised, your serving is compromised, your faith will be easily compromised. The enemy is not going to come to you and appear to you and say, I want you to renounce Jesus Christ. Things don't happen overnight. Now, I've not discussed this with any of the pastors here and not with any of you, but I, I know. I know. I'm going to ask you to show hands here. I know how many people you know who have backslidden now. The first point was, that they stopped coming to church. Put your hand up if you know someone. Yeah? I know people. I've been here for nearly 20 years. The first thing it starts with, let's take them out of the church. Dislocate the plant. Dislocate the tree. Let it not be rooted. Let it not grow. Let it not flourish. And then everything else is easy for the enemy to conquer. I was talking to somebody and I said to that person, come on, be in the church. Be in the church because that's exactly what the enemy wants. You know when depression, anxiety, stress hits, the first thing that comes to your mind is this. I can't be in the church. I can't be in the church. I just need to break. I answer this question. Answer this question in your hearts. And I can listen to your hearts. Okay? I've got that gift. It's just been given to me. Do you think it's God who wants people to be not in the church when they're depressed, stressed, anxious, sick? I heard you. Most of you said no. Some of you are still thinking about it. It's the enemy, right? It's the enemy. We agree? So if the enemy does that, why don't we fight back? If something is forcing me not to be in the place that I need to force myself to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If something is forcing me not to pray, then I need to force myself to pray because something is forcing me not to pray. If something is forcing me not to read the word of God, then I'm going to force myself because I'm going to come against that force and fight with force. Hallelujah. You can compromise your work, miss it for five days, six days, call in sick, whatever, but don't call in sick for the church. Don't call in sick. Don't take long extended holidays and be on the Greek islands. Don't go out shopping on Sundays. Don't go out meeting your friends on Sundays. Don't celebrate your children's birthday on Sundays. Because it's not more important than the house of the Lord. Now you might like it. If you hate me for that, hate me for that. I don't care. Because I'm not here to get anyone's approval. Don't line up parties, functions, and then invite the rest of the people to be there on Sundays. Come on! Be serious. Is this a joke to us when the Lord speaks through the word of God? I'm going on a holy day. I'm trying to miss just one Sunday. Just one Sunday. You know, I've been here for nearly 20 years since September 2003. And some of you are my witnesses. That I've not miss church that I can really even remember. Except if I'm on a mission. I've not missed home groups that I can really remember. Except I'm on a mission. I've not missed my participation in the ministries except if I am on a mission. I might have been extremely sick maybe one point or something and may have missed once in 20 years. I stand as a testament of what God can do when you transplant yourself into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. So when I'm saying these things, I'm not just saying it because I heard it in a book. I'm living it. And I'm seeing the fruitful result of that. That the righteous will flourish when transplanted in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Another thing.
thing the, the enemy uses. People having issues with other people, misjudge. That person is going to You're not coming for the person. Come on, if you're coming for the person, don't come. Because you're coming for the wrong reasons. If you're coming for the Lord, come. Some miss when Pastor Mike is on missions. That is sad. Some miss when we don't have a very dynamic preacher. That is sad. If I'm speaking to you, I ask for your forgiveness. But I'm not sorry for what I'm saying because that is the reality. Amen? Amen. Level two. So you might be at level one, very good, planted in the house of the Lord. You're coming on Sundays and that's great. There's another level. Your extended participation matters. Hebrews 10 verse 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. What does it say? Come on, read it out. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. You know, Pastor Mike came forward and he said something amazing, remarkable, powerful. God is about to do something great. We all got excited. Amen? I'm excited about that. Check this out. What we are supposed to do? If the Lord is about to do something? If the day is approaching? What? Come on, it's simple. Sometimes we complicate matters. It's simple. It tells us if the Lord is about to do something, as the day of the Lord is approaching, do not neglect the meeting together. That meeting together goes and extends outside of that Sunday service. Home group commitments, ladies meeting, men's meetings, other aspects of the meeting together. When the brethren are together, where are the rest of the brethren? Where are the rest of the sisters? Why aren't they there? I heard there was a great turnout at the ladies meeting. But I know how many ladies were also missing. Why? You have something more important to do? I'm, I'm going to be straight. You could go something more important than to be in the house of the Lord and tell me. I'm going to be with there as well. But I don't think so there is anything more important. Imagine if somebody called you and they said we're taking you out for a fine dining restaurant. It's all the treatment is on me. We'll be there. We'll be there. Somebody invites you going for a spa. Come along. I'll be there. But if they invite me on Sunday, I won't be there. Why do we compromise these things? Why? As the day is approaching, do not forsake this and do of the brethren together. It doesn't say start fasting. It doesn't say start prophesying. It doesn't say start praying, even though that is part of that. But that's going to happen when the brethren are together. Anyway, that's part of the things that's going to happen. But you're going to gather together. Don't celebrate your anniversaries on Sunday. I don't. Some wives hate me for this. Don't worry. Hate me, I'm married already. Doesn't matter. Because come on, come on, just question. Is that more important than being in the house of the Lord? Tell me if it is. Stand up and say, I object. I give you the right, like in a court, before the judge. Judge. Objection, Your Honor. Don't say Your Honor. Just say, objection, preacher. I think this is not biblical. I think this isn't theologically correct. Then I will have my lawyer here who will argue the case on my behalf. <laughs> All right, he's in a white shirt. And he will say, no, hold on, hold on. The Bible says this, 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 this. He's already shown you the reference. Come on, I give you an open challenge. Stand and object to anything that I'm saying. If you have no reasons to object to what I am saying, then come on. Come on. Repent from that attitude. Repent from that attitude where we have negotiated and compromised the meeting together. Level two. Level three. Your serving matters. Serving matters. The palm tree go to produce fruit. Right? Amen? Yes. You still with me? I feel like this is my last sermon.
the palm tree got to produce fruit. I said, please, and this fruit here as well. Just put it on this table here. I nearly forgot those things. Not only that we've got to transplant ourselves in the house of the Lord for proper growth. Second, second thing we've got to do is that we've got to, to go further and start serving. Amen? Everybody say start serving. Start serving. start serving in the house of the Lord. Not anywhere else. Okay? Our priority has to be correct. Alright? And I just want to show this slide, you know, because a lot of the times we, we, we muddle up our priorities. We muddle up our, our priorities. And there is one that I was previously taught and was uh, told that this should be the right priority in a believer's life. God first, family second, third ministry, fourth work and friends. Do you agree with that? Don't, because I'm going to not agree with that. Okay? So don't agree with that. If you did agree with that previously, it's okay. The real priority is this. This is the real priority. God equals to serving God. How can you separate your faith from your actions? James said, if you say to somebody, God bless you, and you believe in God, but yet you don't back that up with your works and actions, then how good is that faith? How good is it that I say I love God, but I'm not there in His presence? How good is it that I say that I want to be like the palm tree, but I don't want to be transplanted in the house of the Lord? I don't want to serve in the kingdom of God. I don't want to use my gifts and actions for the advancements of the kingdom of God. What is the use of that? Where is the love for God if I don't show it through my serving? Does that make sense? Yes. Does that make sense? Then after that you can put your family and your work and your friends and everything else. Yes. But if you're not here and if you claim to be a believer, you need to reevaluate yourself and you really need to see where you are really planted. Because if you are planted in the wrong place, then the verse 13 says that you need to be transplanted in the house of the Lord. Which means your focus, your attention, your life needs to revolve around the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Attend. Extended attend. And then serve. There's a structure in the house of the Lord. People just did not come to the temple and they said, yeah, great. This is day of atonement. But here we go. I was partying last night. I forgot to bring the lamp. They had to adhere to the structure. They came to the temple. They did what the temple required. They offered what was required of them. Otherwise, we are creating our own rules, our own structures of the church. You've got to understand there are structures that God gives us, so the serving goes into that structures. Now, I'm not saying we, of course, cannot ever uh, neglect our families. I can't be a pastor if I don't pastor my own family. You with me? I can't be a disciple of Christ if I don't disciple my own household. If I don't have good terms and relationships in my own family because of me, then I shouldn't be out there in the first place prioritizing God for in the first place. An elder must be able to sort out his own affairs in his own household well, then he's appointed as an elder. Not saying neglect the families. Not saying don't celebrate like this. Not saying don't go for spa. Don't, I'm not saying don't go for holidays. I'm not saying, you know, of course there's a time for everything, but a limited time in comparison to the house of the Lord and our commitment to God. Am I, am I speaking to someone? Amen. Amen? I'm not English, so I don't like to beat around the bush. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes you need to do that. You go around and you know you're trying to make a point. I'm just so straight. Because the word of God is straight. And sometimes we need straight, yeah. the sharp sword. Yeah. The third point is, they will still, this is my, my final point, they will still bear fruit in old age. What is the key element for being bearing fruit? I've already been saying that. I've already been saying that. The key element is point two, that they need to be transplanted in the house of the Lord. Amen? They need to be transplanted. Now, the way this message came about to me was quite remarkable. 
One day I was just doing a bit of a gardening. I'm not a great gardener, but I do a little bit whatever I can because I have a garden, you know. Um, and I bought these little flowers, holes, you know, this, you know the little ones that you get for two, three pounds in Sainsbury's and all that, working from Sainsbury's. And it says that it can grow up to 60, 70 centimeter, but you've got to plant it outside. So I, I brought them home, dug a little hole with Matthias, in a little garden activity, planted those flowers, and, and uh, did a bit of a watering, and, and I was coming back into the kitchen, and I was putting those empty plastic pots into the bin, and Holy Spirit just spoke to me. Just spoke to me these particular verses, and he said, you know what? These flowers were already planted. They were already planted. But they will not grow to the extent that they need to grow because they were planted in the wrong place. So it doesn't really matter if you are just planted. What matters is that where you are planted. Does that make sense? It's where you are planted. Which house of the Lord you are planted matters. The ground, the soil, conditions matters. It doesn't just matter. You know that you are just planted. The ground conditions matter. And if the ground is not correct, if the ground does not provide you unlimited possibilities to serve God, then you are not planted in the right place. Then you need to transplant yourself in the correct house of the Lord. This is a good house of the Lord. And I'm not getting commission for saying that. But I'm saying this because I know it, that the structure that God has given to us, the mandate that the Lord has given to us, the discipleship training program, involving people into ministry, involving people into encounter weekends, and from there, pushing them, encouraging them to say, come on, do what the Lord has called you to do. That is a God-given structure. If you are planted in a ground like this, you will grow. You will grow unless you want to restrain your own growth. Then even God can't help you. So if you are not transplanted, in the right place. You know, and I'm not saying that you know you only got to work in Holy Nation Church or whatever. Look at this. I've got a mango here. This is a Pakistani mango. The best, arguably. The best, right? <laughs> now, if you haven't had a Pakistani mango, right? I uh, cannot give this to you. I want to give this to, to somebody if he's in a church today. I'm gonna is Frank Frank here? Frank, where is Frank? No, not this Frank. The other Frank. The other Frank's friend's wife is here. This, I'm going to give it to Frank because he loves mangoes. He, he has a, a, a great taste for mangoes. And I wanted to introduce him to the real mangoes. <laughs> you know, being planted in the house of the Lord does not mean that your fruit is not seen in the wider world. Are you with me? The context of planting helps you to bear fruit, that fruit can be exported and given to the nations, but you've got to have a base. I can't bring that mango tree from Pakistan and plant it in England. That would be a disaster. It will never grow to beautiful mangoes. But we can leave it where it is planted because that is the right place where it should be planted and still enjoy its fruit. Now some of you are getting this. Some of you are still not getting it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just say in plain words, is this. That you can be planted in the house of the Lord, serve in the house of the Lord here. But sky is the limit, unlimited possibilities of what you can do with your life. But you've got to have a base. Now if you find a better base, then please go and be transplanted where the Lord leads you. But while you are in Holy Nation Church, you've got to do what the house of the Lord requires. Because that is the structure of this house of the Lord. Now if you don't agree with it, that's okay. You are under no obligation to be transplanted here. You are under no reasons to be here if the Lord has not spoken to you. But if the theology is right, and if you sense the Spirit of God, and if you know that God moves in this place, and if the Lord has spoken to you, then why not transplant to all the three levels? Do you understand what I'm saying? And then from there you can bear fruit and take it to the wider world. In fact, we go to the wider world. Please pass that to Rita. <laughs> Rita is there. The fruit can be seen far and wide. But the base, the soil has to be there. I've got this little palm tree here to show you. Okay? This 
palm tree can grow way bigger than what it looks like right now. This is not the date palm, but it is a type of palm. Okay? But in order for this palm tree to grow, it cannot stay in that palm. The port you are sitting in right now is one of the nutriest port you can get. The port you are sitting in right now is one of the most anointed, blessed port. The port where the Lord has led you to is one of the best port because it has the structure for you to grow and bear fruit. The righteous shall flourish, be successful, be successful, flourish, be fruitful. Do what the Lord has called you to do. Produce the fruit what you need to produce. But level one, church attendance. Level two, home groups. Other meetings together. Level three is that serve. Give in to the structure. Give in to the disciple training program. Give in to what the leaders require. Or in other words, what the farmers are saying to the tree. Come on, let me trim this a little bit. This is coming out a little bit. We need to take that off because this is dead. We need to look that and we need to look at this. Come on, let's just do something. This, this is getting too small for this particular one. Let's plant it somewhere else. Let's give it another assignment. Let's do this. There's so many things that has to happen in the house of the Lord. But if we don't submit to that structure, if we don't submit to that care, if we don't submit to what the Lord wants in the house of the Lord, we will never ever see the fruitfulness. You know what an interesting, another interesting fact about palm trees is? This is for Pastor Mike. They are one of the slowest ones to grow. They're not the quick ones. Some trees, they shoot up, ready, and here to your time, fruitfulness. But they don't withstand the test of many things either. Palm tree takes its time. It takes time. It takes time. They're one of the slowest. But once they reach that fruitful level, it is unstoppable. It's consistent every year round, and then they stay evergreen. Amen? Do you see the analogies? Why God uses the words, you got to be like the palm tree? In closing, I just want to highlight a couple of worship. If the worship team want to take a stand, take a stand. You know, I've, I've given some palm branches here. Now I'm going to make a connection to those palm branches in a moment. I want to just highlight this particular verse from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 13. Check this out. I don't know if you ever saw this connection before. I did and I saw it now. You got it? The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took palm trees and went out to meet him or palm branches, branches of the palm trees, and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you know what happens in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9? It says, after this I saw a vast crowd too great to come from every nation, tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne. And before the Lamb they were clothed in white robes and had palm branches in their hand doing the same thing. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah! 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 There's palm branches were a representation of the people themselves. When I wave a Pakistani flag, that means I'm representing Pakistan. When I wave a British flag, that means I'm representing a British uh, nationality. When I wave an Indian flag, that is a representation that I am Indian, right? But what were they waving? They were waving palm branches. So what did that represent? It represented the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, like a palm tree. The palm tree that God wanted them to be. So they were waving there with the palm leaves to welcome the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's not just limited to that traditional Palm Sunday. Hence the title of the message, every Sunday is a Palm Sunday. But if the branches are missing in that Palm Sunday, who's going to cry out to Hosanna? Who's going to cry out to the Lord? Jesus rode to the Mount of Olives. Come on, let's stand. Jesus rode to the Mount of Olives. He rode on a donkey into Jerusalem and then went straight into the temple. Every Sunday, our Lord, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, rides into this place. Where are the palm branches? 
Where are the palm branches that need to be waved in my hand? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Sleeping? Where are they? Too tired? Where are they? Partied last night on, 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 on Saturday so they couldn't come? Or got more pressing issues? Festivals? Parties? Functions? Visit relatives? Attend weddings? Do all sorts of different things? Where are they? Where are the palm branches that need to be waved in front of the Lord and cry out Hosanna in the highest? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now tonight you might not feel, today you may not feel like the righteous one. So we can even take a step back. You might think I'm not righteous, I'm not godly, I, I'm the palm tree. But I want to say one thing to you. Today, through the sacrifice of Lord Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice of Lord Jesus Christ, you can become that righteous palm tree. All your sins can be washed away. And you can become that palm tree. Amen. I'm going to let Pastor Mike pursue that further and take us further.